We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they get logged. They go on my Gmail and they're not going to get lost. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, tonight we've got a question from patron of the show, Math Guy Dave. How do you deal with game night failure? Bad RPG session or a game that players didn't enjoy? Maybe even drama between players. Well, thanks for the excellent question and for supporting the show, Dave. Dave's been an active member of the Discord. He uh, popped in here earlier. I'm not sure if he's still around, but he is a part of the growing community building up there in Discord. It's much appreciated. Yeah, I was going through my question list. I'm like, oh, I know that name. <laughs> All right. First off, the, the first thing everyone should be well aware of is that bad game nights are going to happen. Uh, there is no way every game night is going to be a great one. No matter how much time and focus you put into it, no matter how many game nights you've already hosted, no matter how many events you've attended, no matter how many great podcasts offering gaming advice you listen to, things do go wrong. We've talked about aspects of this, particularly with kids and trying to teach from an early age how to handle things like losing or unenjoyable games, but many of us didn't get that sort of training, instead being brought up in a more of a Monopoly table flip generation. Table flip is never the answer. All right, when things go bad, realize it's not the end of the world. One thing I try to always remind people about gaming and game night when I'm at game nights on this podcast multiple times is that it's meant to be a fun way to spend time with your friends and other gamers. While we're all gaming together to share social experiences and enjoy the game and each other's company. No matter what happens, it's only a game. It's a pastime. It's not actually important in the grand scheme of things. Now, I'm not trying to devalue the importance of gaming or play. Play is very important on many social and psychological levels. I'm just saying that compared to the other things that can go wrong, a bad game night is pretty low on the hierarchy of bad stuff. Well, unless your game night goes really off the rails, but I think we're going to assume that no one gets knifed at this game night or otherwise requires hospitalization. Yeah, in that case, your solution is just 911 as quick as possible and get to a safe spot. All right, let's get into some specifics of what to do when certain things go wrong. How to handle a few distinct situations. But first, please note, I'm no psychologist, neither is Sean. We aren't doctors, though we may play one in a tabletop RPG. Uh, this advice here is based on personal experiences, what's worked and what hasn't for us, as well as listening to, reading, and consuming a variety of gaming advice from others over the years and hearing what works for others and doesn't for them. What we suggest here may not be what's right for your group. Know your players. You know your players better than we do. And that last part is really the most important part. Know your players, as the better you know them, the more you can avoid or easily minimize the problems that we're going to go into here. All right. Well, will start with board games, where card games, miniature games, non-RPGs, where you're not playing characters, you're not playing a campaign. Uh, what do you do when this goes bad? Now, that's going to depend on exactly what happened. So we're going to put aside the people problem completely for now. We will get to them eventually. Same thing when we talk about RPGs. We're not talking about problem players at this point. We're talking about things going wrong in the game. For example, well, I guess it's a people problem, but someone's not enjoying the game but not because of the other players. It's just they don't like the game. The game you're playing is broken. It happens. The, the, there's a fundamental rule problem. There's something that doesn't work. You have a runaway leader. Like, there is no way anyone's going to win. Deanna's got the game, and you can tell halfway through. You can't figure out the rules. This happens. You, you got the rule book in front of you. You're playing, and it's just not working. Or you figure out halfway through, you've been playing with a rule wrong. And other situations like this. So that's just, we're trying to, this is probably the broadest category, right? Something goes wrong in the game and you're at that point, what do you do? Well, in these cases, you always have the option to start, stop the game and either start over or play something else. We mentioned this multiple times on the podcast. It's all, it should be one of the Bellhop's rules at this point. We reiterated so much. There is no need to finish every game you start. And yes, we know it's hard. It's really hard to do. There's the thing called the sunk time fallacy 
that sit there telling you that if you quit, everything we've done up to that point was wasted. Like, we, if I don't finish it, I've wasted my time. Well, you know what? So is finishing the game you're not enjoying. It's just as much a waste of time. Now, I know for a fact this is something that Mo has a problem with, in part because as a reviewer, it's his job to see where things are broken wow. and see it through to the end. Um, and I got caught recently in an online play of Through the Ages where I kept thinking that I could find some enjoyment or figure out a way out of the hole I dug when four turns earlier I should have bowed out. And that would have been more enjoyable for me and for the other two players who had to watch me descend into uh, the, the deficit of points especially when that game in particular has a mechanic yeah. to extract oneself from a game built in. But even if the game doesn't have a mechanic to stop, you can still stop it. The thing, though, is make sure everyone is on the same page. Pause the game and ask the group. Uh, so many of these problems that we're going to mention tonight can be solved just by talking. Is everyone still having fun? Like, if you notice people are having fun, ask. It looks like Dave's the winner. Is no matter what we do, Dave's going to win. Do we still want to finish the game or do we just want to give it to Dave and then maybe play another round? Or, okay, now that we figured out we have played the first 15 rounds of this game completely wrong and now we know how it works. You want to start over? Then we totally flubbed this one. Stuff like that, right? Have that conversation. Yep. Now, watch people and watch people's reactions and where their attentions are. This goes not only for the host, but everyone at the table. We all got caught up in get caught up in games, so we should all try and remember to pay attention to one another and watch for those signs that someone is checking out or frustrated or just plain hating it. All right, the next situation uh, hypothetically I came up with is one or more of the players are eliminated from the game, but the game's still going. This isn't as common with most modern hobby games, but it's definitely a thing with older games. Now, this may be a reason to stop the game because so many people have been eliminated, but that's probably not what the entire group is going to want to do. And again, you have that conversation. This in particular, though, is why I like to pack quick filler games to game nights, something to give people to do between games. So one of the ones, despite the fact I'm not a huge lover of the game, is Suro, because it's a little click and light, but it's perfect for this because it plays up to eight players, and it's really simple to play and really simple to teach. And I can take less than five minutes from the game we're currently playing to show the eliminated players how to play Suro. Other games like that, like two-player abstracts, I also find really good for that, like the Duke or Santorini, which is a three-player abstract that, again, is fairly simple to teach. Or kids' games, stuff like Rhino Hero, can be great to easily distract the eliminated players while the rest of the players finish the game. Just try and ensure that the eliminated players aren't going to pull focus from the main game. <laughs> you don't want people looking over longingly at the Rhino Tower. Why well, wishing they were over there and not still playing whatever. <laughs> Very true. Uh, another thing to make sure is let people know they don't have to stick around if they don't want to. Now, this is more applies to, again, we're still talking about player elimination, games with player elimination. If you're playing a big epic game, one of those all night, all weekend, 12 hour extravaganzas, your advanced civilizations, your bigger war games, your 4X games, your Twilight Imperiums, right? While it may be fun for you to sit through the final four hours of Twilight Imperium after getting eliminated in the first two, that may not be for everyone. You might want to stick and see who betrays who and where it goes. But you know what? I, maybe it's time to check out and head home. This is also true for shorter games, even. Someone may not want to wait 45 minutes for the next game to start if they have other things they could be doing in an event. We recently had this happen in an easy mode event where we played a game with a, with a couple and then they... We're kind of stuck in the limbo while everything else was going on, and they chose to leave, which is perfectly fine. And that's something to really try and clarify in advance, probably even before people arrive on an organized game night, but certainly before starting in on some real heavyweight games with long play times, if there's going to be player elimination, clarify what's available if people will choose to stay, mm -hmm. but also that no one will be upset if you choose to go somewhere else. All right, moving on to another problem. While all companies try to write the perfect rule book and make their rules clear, no one is out there actually trying to obfuscate the rules. Rule disagreements can come up. We've got an entire episode about what to do when you've got a bad rule book. This is episode 29. And this can be a problem. Like, it can be a terrible rule book, 
Or sometimes it can be a great rule book, but rule questions still come up because not every rule book is going to cover every possible situation in the game. Now, thankfully, we live in the future, being 2020 right now, and 99% of the time, an answer is just a Google search away. This is actually what I recommend groups do if something like this comes up. Head over to Board Game Geek. That's probably the best place. Look up the game or look for an official FAQ and find an answer for whatever the rule problem is. Go with the actual official reply on the official FAQ and continue playing. Yeah, now often a game in, in and of itself uh, is, is, can be made as everyone races to find the answer first or works to disambiguate the various answers that are found when there's no official FAQ to, uh, to be found. Yeah, no official FAQ comes up, unfortunately, a little more frequently than I'd like. So let's say you can't find the right answer, right? So then it's up to the group to come to a consensus. As I mentioned before, one of the main solutions to many of these problems is communication. I, if coming to a consensus is a problem for your group, I do suggest one of two things. One's really simple. You're all gamers. Roll a die or use some other randomizer or do some type of vote on who on, on what ruling is correct. And if you're worried about her feelings, do the vote blind. Like have everyone go, okay, is rule one or two? Write it down, one or two on a scrap of paper. Shuffle them up, count them up. That way no one's insulted that someone went against them or not. The important thing, though, is no matter what the result is, stick to it. Rules for games should not be mutable. Now, again, we're talking board games, RPGs, or a different story. Board games have rules, distinct rules, and there's none of the silly stuff like, well, it doesn't say I can't. Well, it doesn't say I can't punch you in the face either, right? I, that, that particular excuse I've heard too many times at game nights for someone behaving badly. Um, stick with the get rules. Whatever your ruling is at the time, that becomes the rule for the rest of the game for sure, and probably the rest of the game night. And if you have a regular group, you probably want to make a note of what that rule was and throw it in the box so that it becomes the rule from then on. Then after the game night's done, though, do some research, right? Like if you're the owner, I, I would suggest whoever owns the game do this, but whoever, whoever the alpha gamer in the group is, Go home and, and check, is there a proper answer? And if there isn't, that's where you post on Board Game Geek, right? Or send an email to the designer or tag them on Twitter. Like, all these things are pretty easy to do nowadays. Heck, we have game designers that show join our live chats on our podcast now. So we, we get feedback is, is easier to get than ever nowadays. Yeah. Now, one thing to watch, don't spend too much time on it, uh, especially if you have a short game night. Especially if you're meeting for three or less hours, don't, like, like 15, 10 minutes, maybe even five might be long enough. Like, if you don't find it after a quick Google search, if you look on board game, don't see, and, like, every game has a rules forum. If you don't see it in the rules forum on Board Game Geek, which will only take you a few minutes to look at, you're probably spending too long. Just come up with a quick fix, move on, and then, again, do the research later. Yeah, I would say about five minutes is probably right. I know I, a couple of times when playing uh, DC Deck Builder with my kids, you know, every once in a while, you get one of those card combinations where you're like, wait a second, can this actually be as stupidly powerful as I think it is? Um, and sometimes you don't get an answer. Uh, you know, again, because I'm playing with my kids, I usually default to the non-stupidly powerful yeah. version and then go look it up later. But uh, it's it's actually something that I have realized I don't always go and deal with like, afterwards if I haven't found the answer during um, so, you know, maybe keep a notepad nearby or, or, or use your phone and write down the note that, hey, we need to look up this rule because, you know, a couple hours later, you're probably not going to remember that you had that uh, problem in the first place. Uh, and it may happen easily again the next time. Yeah. So uh, if possible, continue playing as much as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless the questions resolution prevents all forward motion of the game, but that's generally a pretty rare instance. Or if it does, many others will probably have had that same problem. So it should be an easier answer. Yeah, it's it's very seldom nowadays we can't find an, an official answer. Note on Board Game Geek, though, to watch for what an official answer is, because you will get all kinds of people yeah, commenting. You'll get a lot of pe non-official people yes. discussing well, well, a problem without an actual answer. Yeah, watch watch for official FAQs and the actual designers to chime in. All right, moving on to the next problem. What if you show up and no one knows what to play? There's too many games. This happens all the time in my own basement. We got you covered on that one. Uh, this one we've covered already. We got an entire episode, entire blog post about it. Uh, that's episode 53. Uh, there we discussed a ton of options, including the host picks because they're hosting, so that's their privilege. Uh, a few different voting systems and even some online options like board game menu. 
just check out that episode and the associated article for even more options. But what I will reiterate here is very similar to what we just talked about. Don't take too long. You don't want picking the game to play to be the game for that night. Uh, try to get something to the table as quickly as possible. Get people gaming right away. Yeah. Uh, another instance where prep in advance can sidestep these issues and prevent it from becoming a bad game night. Yeah. All right, jumping over to the RPG side for, for a little while here. Personally, I think having a bad RPG session just isn't as desire as, as dire, sorry, not as desire, as dire as having a bad board game, having a board game go bad. Because when board games go bad, it's done, right? The game's done. Uh, unless you're running a one shot, because then your RPG shot. But off nights are pretty much par for the course for most RPG campaigns. They're going to happen. Um, they're going to be there just along with the memorable nights your group never forgets and talks about 10 years later. While most RPG sessions go bad, you just move on, right? Oh, that wasn't the best session tonight. It wasn't great. There's always the next session to get back things on track. And the other benefit of RPGs is there's that downtime in between, right? So you can analyze what went wrong and make sure it didn't happen again. Yeah, bad nights uh, in this vein are things like uh, TPK, quest failures, item loss, things the whole group can commiserate about. The paladin lost their holy relic broadsword. Maybe the bard has something they can offer until they can find a replacement. Just make sure it's not that one with a demon in the helmet. Or make sure it is. All right. Most of the situations I have mentioned above can happen in RPGs. Most of the tabletop situations we mentioned. And the solutions are basically the same, right? If players aren't having fun, consider stopping the game. Though, again, with an RPG, it's a little different because the players as a group, uh, with the GM possibly having more control over this, depending on your group dynamic, is you can change the game you're currently playing. Like, I don't mean change it, like switch to a different game. I mean change what's happening in the game. Right? If the players aren't having fun shopping for gear, jump to the next scene. Or if they're getting really frustrated by the fact they haven't found a clue that need, it needs to happen to move the game on, you have an NPC offer it to them. Or they just find the clue. Right? Like it does, they don't need to make that roll that they've been trying for eight hours. It's modern role playing nowadays, right? You don't call for a die roll for something that can stop the plot dead. All choices should go somewhere. Um, characters aren't, people aren't enjoying the players. Characters they made. Players aren't enjoying the characters they made there. Uh, this happens, right? It happens more often. And there was an old school thing where, like, once you put it on the sheet, it was written in stone. I've never, ever, Sean's played in my games. You've been playing your same character for six months, and you suddenly go, you know what? I've had this sweep for six levels, and I've never used it. Do you mind if I swap it? Yes, please, swap it. Go for it. Change that character. Player fun is way more fun, more, more important in an RPG than for similitude or simulation. We've never been the type to be rules lawyers in, in our games. Uh, if the dice aren't being conned, maybe don't roll for things that are required to advance the plot. The yeah. whole party's standing around while the roll, while the rogue rolls endlessly to try and disarm the trap and open the door isn't going to be an enjoyable experience. Yeah, the, the most game designers nowadays have learned, right? You don't have that stop, that wall, right? There's an entire rule system based on the fact this was a problem in Call of Cthulhu called Trail of Cthulhu, where you always find the clue automatically, right? Make sure things keep moving. All right, rule disputes. We talked about it with board games. Same deal here, in my opinion. You could look it up the same way you could a board game rule book. And I know there are a bunch of RPG people out there, including rule books, that are going to call heresy on this. I know people say, don't break the immersion, don't stop the game to look up rules, just make it ruling and keep going. I, that's never been me. Personally, I don't mind taking a break to look through the rules. I like to run my RPGs raw, like rules as written. Again, not really a rules lawyer, but I like to stick to the rules because the person who created the game put the rules there for a reason. And to me, the rules in an RPG represent the physics of the world the characters are in. And if it's not consistent, you can't play your characters properly because you don't know how things are going to happen every time if the rules keep changing. Now, it's a personal belief I have for RPGs, and I know not everyone agrees with me, but I personally, we stop the game, we look it up. Like, who cares? You got to flip through some books. Now it's a chance for people to use the washroom to sit there and, you know, tally up their gold, to go grab a snack or whatever. And again, like with board games, some folks will enjoy the race to be the one to find the right answer on paragraph yep. three of page 47 of book six of the, you know, whichever. Mm -hmm. It's a game. Yep, it's a game. Plus, nowadays, almost everything's in PDF and searchable, too. So it's not quite the same as it used to be where you're going through your tomes of D&D &D books to look up that one obscure rule. All right. Now, those are the, the, the light problems, we'll call them. There are a few things that could go wrong that can ruin an entire campaign. 
Now, there is a ton of advice out there on these situations, and we're only going to barely scratch the surface here, because each of these topics have had multiple blog posts, podcast episodes dedicated to each one of them. If you're looking for more advice beyond what we cover here, it's out there. That said, if any part of this, anyone wants us to deep dive later during an episode, feel free to let us know, and we'll consider it a topic for a future show. Ooh. All right, going to start off with the dreaded TPK. For anyone who doesn't know what that means, it means total party kill. What do you do when all the characters die during a campaign game? It happens. Uh, one, of, one of the things Shauna mentioned before is pre-planning. Don't let that happen. That could be your solution ahead of time. But let's say it does. What, what, whatever, based on the system you're playing, how you play, let the dice fall where they may. Everyone dies. Well, we're back to the, the, the basics here. Have a conversation with the group. Right then, right there. Say, hey, everyone died. What are we going to do? Uh, this, to me, isn't something that should be decided by the GM. This should be the entire group, the entire team. All of the players at the table, including the DM, should be talking to determine part of the solution to what happens next. Now, to be proper, to be proactive, to use a overused term, this can be done before the campaign even starts, during session zero, and that might be the best option, right? Have a plan in place. What do we do if we have a TPK? And decide ahead of time. Now, Bob I'll admit. Junior, on the end of all your character names, and years later, another party comes across <laughs> the belongings of the first, sworn from infancy to avenge the loss of the first of their names. It's a game. <laughs> have fun with it. Yeah. Or find something else that's fun. Whatever you end up doing. I, again, this goes back to the board game advice. Either... You, you keep playing, or you move on to something else. Maybe you make new characters ready to avenge the old ones, as Sean said. Maybe you play hirelings, NPCs, or other associates of the main characters and continue their quest. Maybe you make a new party, but stay with the same game world and events. Having the death of the characters impact that campaign, so it's now an event that happened in that game world. Personally, I like that because then you get the, the end story of those characters and you get to see the impact they had. Or maybe it's a chance to start a whole new campaign with a new world, maybe even a new system, or even a new DM or GM. Now, this is one I particularly like in this case, because I got to say, you know what? TPKs can be, I hate using this word because some people take it too seriously, but traumatizing. Like, it, it can be a shock to the system. It can be, a damaging is not the right word, but, like, people don't always take it well. And it's understandable. And this isn't just the player whose character died. This can be hard on the GM. And maybe this is a good chance to give everyone a break, change things around, and move as far away from as possible that original campaign by giving that GM a break and letting someone else take on the lead. If you've been, uh, you know, playing D and D uh, adventurers leagues and you all get wiped out, go and play some Cyberpunk twenty twenty or play a Shadow Elf cyber thingy. <laughs> <laughs> cyber Elf Shadow thingy. That, that, that'll be our new uh, our new cyberpunk playing game. There you go. All right, a similar problem happens when one or more players drops out of the game for whatever reason. Um, we covered this somewhat, like not directly, but in our absentee player episode. That was just a few be weeks back in episode 74. Uh, but that was more about players not making it for one or two sessions. When someone leaves a game for good, you need something more permanent than most of the stuff we suggested then, though some of it's valid. Now, this could mean ending the game as we just talked about, right? With the same, have a conversation and decide if you're going to end it or not. But more likely, it just involves the GM or the group, if it's a shared GM role, modifying the story, right? Like just twisting it a bit, modify the story and the plot. Um, personally, I prefer if there's an in-game reason for the characters to fade from focus or go out with a bang, whichever way you go. Like I'm all for the heroic sacrifice, right? Someone leaves the game, especially if you can pre-plan it. If you know they're leaving, give them that big bang before they go. But if not, have this something dramatic happen that where that character leaves a mark on the world. Though, if players are leaving under less favorable circumstances, which does happen, it may just be better to have him fade to black and continue the story as if they were never there. Yeah, this is one that's very reliant on the situation and really requires each situation to be handled uh, individually and maturely, carefully based on the people involved and both the events both in real life, and in the mm -hmm. game leading up to the departure. Now, losing players could mean a, a more dramatic change for your group because you may not have enough people left to continue the game. Now, in this case, again, you could end the game or move on to something that works with less players. 
or it might be a chance to recruit new players. Now, player recruiting is an entirely different topic and not one we're going to dive into tonight. So we have touched on it in some previous episodes, but of course you'd listen to them all by now, right? Of course, right from episode one. So I don't recommend going back that far, though we did cover some good stuff. All right, a different aspect of this is character death, not player death, character death. So player death, we basically just covered with one above. Um, there's where you really want to have a character quote with a bang. Um, just one or two characters die, not the whole party, right? Not a TPK. Uh, this is similar to having a player leave, except you don't have to worry about the group getting too small, right? You still got everyone there. In most cases, this is just a matter of the GM adjusting the story and the plot, right? Take into account the current character's death, add in any new characters the players make, and keep things moving. Now, what can be more difficult is how well the players handle their character deaths, which leads us to dealing with player drama. And this is really, I think, the, the main topic here in some ways. Uh, so much of the other aspects can be handled with a little bit of pre-planning, your session zero, your pre-game chat. But uh, we hope that our friends and fellow players are mature enough to deal with most of the issues in a reasonable manner. Mm -hmm. The fact is we all have off days. We may not know what another person has going on in other aspects of their life. And for whatever, for whatever reason, in the moment, things may become problematic. Yeah, we're all humans, right? I hope so. Or even if we're not, we probably still all have our emotional beings. No Vulcans playing at my table. Um, we're, we're all playing these games together, and sometimes our emotions can get the better of us. Tempers flare, people get hurt and upset. In-game conflict becomes out-of-game conflict, and sometimes RPG characters' feelings bleed into real life. Actually, especially when you get into, like, LARPing and that, the bleed is a real, actual thing that happens, and people talk about that. Sometimes emotions can be a mess, and they can ruin a game night. Now, ideally, again, while you may not be able to avoid this with a Session Zero mm -hmm. uh, or a, or a pregame chat, what you can do is establish some ground rules on how, mm -hmm. as a group, you want to handle it when it comes up. Because I don't think anyone should assume that, oh, well, we're just not going to have problems like that. A character <laughs> die, a character die. No, no. Things happen, you know? Maybe one of the members in the party was just recently divorced and they've been bottling it all up because, you know, you're all gaming friends, but you don't really talk about real life. Well, when something in-game happens, that could trigger some real emotions that they've been bottling up and need to get out. And as a group, while you may not need to prepare for specifically that exact circumstance, you should be prepared that, look, one of our players has a problem. That's more important than what else is going on right now. Yeah, definitely. All right, so let's say things go bad, right? People have gotten upset. I, it doesn't matter how, right? So some, someone's drunk, someone's behaving badly, someone said something inappropriate, whatever the situation is. The important thing here, I think, I'm going to literally loop back to where this whole conversation started with a reminder of why are we doing this? Why are we here? This is what everyone needs to be reminded of. When things get heated, it's time for everyone to remember you're all here to play games together. You're here to share a pastime with each other and have a good time playing games. Stop whatever's going on, take a break, have everyone get up, stretch, walk around, pause, and remind people why they're here. Um, tell them, like, we're, we're here to play games. If you're not here to play games, we're all here together. We, we came together to sit down, social have fun, et cetera. Remind people of that. Give them the, the heads up that, hey, focus, this is why we're here. Now, one problem that may emerge is while games are and should be fun, part of the definition of a game is competition. Uh, and the majority of games, at least board games, we'll leave RPGs aside for the most part, involve winners and losers. Yeah. Um, but even within RPGs, you know, we've talked in other episodes about competitiveness and about that, you know, those players that need to win. And, and you know, maybe it's even uh, not, not one player all the time, but just it happens. Uh, competitiveness either is there or can emerge in both types of gaming. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be an issue when you're, you know, it's not all about the fun because someone is trying to focus on the competitiveness above and beyond. The, the fun mm -hmm. of a gaming session. Yeah, the thing is, often just taking that moment, right? Just diffusing the situation. 
and taking a break will be enough to, to especially the hottest heads, right? The, the, especially the anger, the quick emotions, the quick, fast, hard emotions. But then after you have the break, you need to have that shall you, shall we continue conversation. The one we basically moved, we talked about above when talking about board games, role-playing games, getting everyone on the same page, right? If people want to call it a night, call it a night. As I've said before, and we're going to say many times, not every game night is perfect. And if you're having a bad one, just like a bad game, end it. Call it, even if it's early. There's no need to to complete something you've started. Remember that lost time fallacy I mentioned. You didn't waste your time so far, and maybe the rest of your time for the night is better spent doing something else. Turn lost time into not losing more time. Maybe I shouldn't have done this as long as I did, but doing more of that thing I shouldn't have been doing isn't going to magically make the old stuff better. Yeah, there, there's no reason to push through it. It's not a competition. You're not going to win a reward for finishing a bad game night. Now, if people are still interested in gaming, uh, maybe it's time to swap up what's getting played. If people are getting upset, there's a reason, right? That people don't, it, it may be something out of game, but it's possible it's the game. Or it could be a mechanic in the game. Or it could be that they're in last, the person's in last place and they know they can't win. Or they've been rolling ones all damn night long and their character is totally deprotagonized, right? These are all things that come up in games. In that case, it's probably best to end that particular game, that particular session. Now, if it's a problem with another player, not only end the game, and yes, end the game if two players have a problem with each other, but after that, split those players up. This is okay. You don't have to enjoy playing games with every other gamer on the planet. Look up the geek social fallacies. There is no bond between all us people who grew up as geeks together, except for the fact we have a standard upbringing. There's, there's no, you don't have to play with everyone. You don't have to love everyone and you don't have to invite everyone to your table. Now I'm not saying this as a gatekeeping, keep people out. I'm saying don't allow play with people you don't enjoy playing with. We all have our own idiosyncrasies, and sometimes those aren't compatible with one another. Now, if there's only one game going on, obviously it has to end. But if there are other groups and multiple games and it's a game night, just move to another table and game with a different group of people. Now, sometimes diffusing the situation by reminding people what they're there for doesn't work. At that point, it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the hard to say. It's the hard thing, right? Uh, you have to be a grown-up, right? Or someone has to, and ask the problem player to leave. This is never fun for anyone involved, both the person being asked to leave and the people asking. Uh, just try to handle it discreetly. Um, I'm no psychologist. I'm not good at this part. I've only had to do it twice, and it's sucked both times. Um, just try to do it without disrupting everyone else. Try not to make a big scene. Try not to set her people out. Just politely ask someone to leave off to the side possibly bring back up with you if you think there's going to be a problem. Uh, that's about the best I can suggest. I'm not a bouncer. I, I, I look for backup when I'm doing things like this. Uh, try to make it as discreet as possible. And, and remember, sometimes removing yourself from the situation might be the best solution. Self-care is vital. And if things are going poorly and the group is not working towards resolutions, you need to make sure that you aren't being impacted by it all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sorry gang, I feel like this just isn't working tonight. I really need to reset. Yeah. Might be the best solution where you can extract yourself from a toxic situation. You know, you can't you can't solve everyone's problems at the table. Yeah, one of the the things you'll see at many cons nowadays, and some people adopt this at their own game table, it's called the open door policy. And what that is is you can walk out of my game at any time, no questions asked. Just get up leave it'd be awesome if you said i'm not coming back or not or i'll be back in five minutes but if you can't handle that because something happened at the table that is legitimate your needs are more important than our game now one of the things you can do and again we get back to prep right being pro proactive doing things ahead of time is especially if you're at in a situation where you may have to ask someone to leave is to have an actual set of documented rules for your game night um, even if this is at your own house, that's up to you. If you want to go that far, we talk about um, table policies and stuff like that before. But especially if you're running a public event, there should be rules. And part of this is the fact that everyone has to agree to these rules. And by having them, when someone does need to be disciplined, it's due to them breaking the rules. And it's not potentially seen as arbitrary. Like, I don't like Dave. 
I'm like, no, it's not that I don't like Dave. Look, here are the rules that Dave agreed to, and here's the rule Dave broke. These rules are here. We all have to enforce them equally. So I'm sorry, Dave, you broke rule six. We're going to have to ask you to leave. Even Dave should understand that better, right? It's a lot easier to ask someone to leave due to violating a clear and written rule that they agreed to follow. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are really harsh on Dave in this world. So yeah, it's, apologies it's, to anyone, uh, anyone Dave. <laughs> it, it, well, it was Dave's question. And that's why Dave keeps popping to my head. And I don't mean it as it's all Dave's part. Apologize to all Dave. <laughs> all right. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while. We, we've we covered quite a few different things, though I know we did not cover every particular circumstance here. Uh, there's no way. We could talk all night and we wouldn't have covered everything possible. Um, and we tried to keep things broad, right? I tried to think of like, oh, your game broke down. What do you do? Not specific situations. Though I do have to say, if there's a situation we missed and you would like to talk to us, talk, like us to talk about it in the future, feel free. Uh, let us know. We'll we'll deep dive any of these if you want us to get into it further. Uh, again, we're not experts. This is just based on experiences we personally experience, stuff I've seen. I've run an awful lot of gaming events over the years, starting since 2002. Um, I've run a lot of RPG sessions too. So I, I think I'm talking from an area of expertise, but I am definitely no expert, uh, especially not a professional level expert. But we are more than willing to discuss any of this further. Well, if you do have a question like this for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email it at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now that we're done with, done with our thoughts on the main topic, let's head over to the lobby and see what they think. I've got a comment here from uh, Word Morningstar. I like to avoid looking up the rules, but I don't feel strongly enough about it to force people to keep playing instead of looking up the rules. Yeah, it's just, I, I see that in books. Like, DM advice is always, just make a ruling and keep going. And I don't feel, I, I have no problem with um, the Misdirected Mark podcast. There's this really good thing where they describe rules of play and how you, you shift during, while you're playing, whether you're at the character level, the player level, the story level, and there's these different levels. I don't have a problem backing out. I never have. Um, to me, RPGs are, are abstractions all the time. I do, I've never felt the, the need for you to feel immersed 100% of the time. It's the same reason... I personally think the, the rules where you're not allowed to talk out a character is a BS is the term I'll use here without, without going less PG. I personally want to, I have a, I have a strong theory that the designers put rules in games for a reason. And I think in general, most RPGs are probably best enjoyed when running them as the person who designed them in, in, intended. And the rules are there for a reason and usually work together as long as you give them a chance. Like I was one of those few people that in AD and D used weapon speeds, used somatic components and tracked encumbrance. I used all those rules and enjoyed using them. And so did my players at the time. Like to, to us, that was all part of the game. The fact that a, a piercing weapon did less damage to a skeleton just made sense to us. Right. I, so we've always tried to do that. And I find if you're at the point where you're breaking too many rules for me, I just rather go find another game. Because there are other games out there, especially if you're looking for F20 fantasy games. I'm sure someone's done an OSR variant that has AD&D without those rules and some other thing about, I don't know, shaping fireballs or something that you think is really cool. Um, so I always try to play raw, like almost always. I think I almost never house rule any of my games. I, I guess I must, part of me must be lawfully aligned to use the D&D setting rules for alignments it's just something i'm about it's the same reason when i read a rule book i start on page one and finish on page 399 and don't flip around but yeah. that, that's me i know other people feel a different way i personally would always rather stop and look up the rule and yet at the same point and you know i said earlier that we aren't rules lawyers and and that comes from the sort of ultimate literal interpretation that happens from some players yeah. you get those players who you know have memorized the books backwards and forwards and can tell you that on Spell Compendium 3, page 47, line 2, it says that you can alternately do, like, come on. I mean, yeah, if technically, if we are point, rules lawyers, we're not rule abusers. Yeah. It's people who use the rules for their advantage. That's not our goal. Yeah. I try to enforce the rules as written. And like I say, I know that's not for everyone. It's, I also enjoy indie games with almost no rules, too, so I can do both. But then I wanted that in my indie game. I don't want that in my D&D 3.5. Yep. Uh, and uh, Jeff mentions, you know, a dead character is an emotional time in many games. But then yeah. 30 minutes later, you've got a new character and you're ready to go. If you weren't upset, then you didn't like that character enough. True. Very true. 
I have character deaths enough to, to stop a session. We've had nights where we stopped. It, it was dramatic enough that the, the, it was worth stopping to continue on. Um, I have had TPKs kill games, but the, the one time I ran Pathfinder, that that game never finished because of a TPK. So it's it definitely happens. What we missed was the big discussion at the end. Yeah. We well, had a bunch of upset people. People went home, and then we never got together again. We should have right then said, what do you want to do, and talked about it. Well, one of the big problems, uh, and uh, in the uh, chat room, uh, Zanister, no, not Zan uh, yes, Zanister was talking about how, uh, you know, he got one-shotted and uh, after a miss and never played D&D again. And that's one yep. of the things that, that can really be affected, I think, is um, depending on where in a game you are, you know, if it's your first session or if it's your 10th session of a game, you might never want to go back to that game because of a player kill or even worse, a TPK. Uh, when in reality, you know, these things do happen and it was bad timing. You didn't get to experience the fullness of the game before that player get death soured you on the system. Um, and that may not always be the case, but it's one of those things where yeah. it's really easy for that death to sour, to sour things, especially if you had liked the character you rolled up. That was my personal experience with D&D. I hated D&D the first time I played it and didn't play it for like 10 years. Finally gave it a shot once second edition Skills and Powers came out because my first experience with Brad running it killed my character in one shot after spending three hours making characters, which should never take three hours to make D&D characters, <laughs> but I didn't know that at the time because I don't even know. We were using every book. I had a plus three shield at level one because... If you worship this god from this book, you started with this, and it was bad. Yep, there's uh, and and Anchi Games is mentioning it was interesting that you talked about how a TPK can be upsetting to the DM too. Uh, it can. And now at the same point, uh, Jeff mentions uh, that uh, uh, where is it? Uh, or sorry, there's a uh, Anchi Games mentions there is a certain DM mindset that sees TPK as a goal. Yes. I think there's a lot more. DMs and DMs out there who are part of the story, right? They're they're yeah. they are part of this shared environment, whether it's a modern RPG or you know something more old school. Um, you know, they're helping everyone else through this story, or they're telling their own story through the players. Uh, and if you've killed off all of the characters in your book, you've got nowhere to go. Yeah, um, there's there's no more story. So it you know. All of a sudden, your novel is over before you wanted it to be. Uh, that can be tough. Uh, there is something to be said. I know Chris Nizak and I have argued about this one in person and on the show a couple times. For the confrontational GM, the the um, adversarial GM, but in the effect of running the game more like a board game, running it as a tournament, running it as a challenge, I do run D and D games like that, and what I am doing then is I am following the raw as close as possible and running a published module only, never my own. It wouldn't work with my own. I can't be arbitrary on my own world. It doesn't work. But if I am using someone else's printed work, and the goal for the players, and we know people who still enjoy this style of play, Deanna being one of them, is they beat that module, and I made it as hard as possible for them to do so while sticking to the limits of the module. And I personally think that is a very valid way to play and can be very enjoyable. The fact Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition plummeted kind of shows that most people don't feel that way. But I don't think the adversarial GM is wrong or bad. What's wrong or bad is the adversarial GM that can, that, that's running their own world. Because there's no challenge in killing characters in a role-playing game. You are the GM. You... You can fudge the dice, you can up the dice, you can have a Beholder show up, you can have a Terra step on them, you can do the rocks fall, you all die. You literally have that power. So why is there any challenge or joy in killing characters off? It just That is the, the adversarial GM I hate. Absolutely. But running a moduli as difficult to the best of my tactical ability and seeing if the characters can get past that obstacle to me is a very valid way to play. And one, a, a style of play I actually enjoy. I think to me, I mean, realistically, uh, if you've got a module and you're playing it for your players, you are essentially a more creative and personal version of a computer RPG. Mm. Um, and and yeah. 
we like computer RPGs. People people deliberately go out and play computer RPGs, and what that is is an adversarial GM. Yes. So it is very much to, to say to say that uh, that you don't like an adversarial GM means you don't play your computer RPGs because that's yeah. what it is. I said it's a different style of play. It's it's, yeah. it's competitive. It, it's more of a game yeah. than a look at the gameist narrative as simulationist. It's simulationist and gameist. It's yeah. you can win, and and to me like what the players get out of that is the bragging rights of playing. This is why Adventure League is popular because all three of us can go play the same adventure under three different DMs and then get together and compare notes and be like, oh, we killed the troll. I'm like, oh, the troll beat us down and like have that shared experience, which is is part something that, that nowadays is only an Adventure League, but used to be a bigger part of D&D, especially in the old days, right? There was, I, I survived the Tomb of Horrors being the one that, yeah, right, you did. But like all of them, right? I went through Lost Caverns of Soul Strand. But I have no idea how to pronounce that word. Uh, or I went through the Temple of Elemental Evil and I did this and comparing your notes, the shared experience of playing through the same module run as as written with the same approximate difficulty, right? Like every DM is going to have their own little tricks. But assuming it's written raw, what you survived is what someone else survived. And you get that shared experience. And I've always enjoyed that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the few... Uh... The ones I've actually done is Dragon Mountain way back on, you yeah. know, too. And and it was fantastic. And it was nice that I could go and talk to other players about right, exactly. my experiences in Dragon Mountain. Um, yeah. Because I, as much as I've always enjoyed all of our plays, you didn't, you generally ran your own worlds for the for most D &D, part. Yeah. Uh, for D&D. &D. And, and, well, we didn't know anyone we could compare with on Warhammer. When, yeah, when you at ran, that uh, time, we didn't know anyone else who did yeah. the enemy with it. But yeah, uh, so but uh, yeah, so no, it was it was a change to be able to talk about, uh, you know, my experiences in Dragon Mountain versus your experiences in Dragon Mountain. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's something in my in, in my opinion is almost lost nowadays. Like there is the Adventures Leap, but there's so many modules, it's a little harder. But that is the one thing I, that I find missing from modern story gaming, right? Like. You played Hydro Hackers, I played Hydro Hackers, someone else played Hydro Hackers, or another Powered by the Apocalypse game. Despite it both being about stealing that block of ice, you would have had a completely different game than I had. Yeah. Like, like our shared experience was the module started off the same, because that's how PBTA goes, right? The the premise was the same. Although there is, there is there, something to be said about that as well, and, and, and to be able to enjoy the differences yes. rather than the sameness. Yeah, that's true. I have had that conversation. Like, oh, what happened in your? Yeah. I oh, who did you play? Name. Who did you play in that? Uh, in that? In yeah, or that from the loop, right? Yeah. Um, you, you get you get a lot of that whole. You know, oh, who did you play yeah. when I, when you played that scenario? What? Oh, wow. Yeah, I got you know completely yeah, flattened by a robot. Right. Oh no, yeah. we went and hid inside the closet or something. And again, nothing against either style of play. Both yeah. perfectly valid, and trust me, I do both. I, I I don't know if that's the equivalent of saying as I have a friend, but. <laughs> I hope not, but I, I play both story games. I have done full improv games. I played the um, the Jim Pinto system there, Protocol. Now I've, I've that's about that's as immersive I got. I have a LARP. I can't talk about LARP. All righty. A note to our guest. Um, though it's not in here. Uh, we I stick around after the show as usual. Those of you here in the lobby, we got some cool stuff. At the end of the show, I have a big old box of games from Ravensburger to open, uh, though not for a really happy reason. But I'll get into that in the after show. I don't think we'll we'll bring it up here on the main show. All right, we'll be checking back into the lobby a few more times during the show. 